extremely happy that we're here in Skopje, that we made it all. I think that's the first thing I wanted to say because Biljana and I, um, together at the time with Cultural Heritage Without Borders, have tried to arrange this for about two years already, had to move it continuously, had to think about how to move on, shall we do it online, shall we do it on site, but then we really wanted to do it on location. So I think the fact that we're all here and that we made it, despite some difficulties traveling for some of us, um, is brilliant. So <laughs> welcome and we're very glad to have all of you here. Um, and yes, um, also here in Skopje because of the theme title, I think you will say a bit more about that later, the workshop, we thought actually Skopje is an excellent place or space to discuss our main theme of our topic, preserving place and space for marginalized belongings through culture, heritage and art. Huh? A region that's not at the center of focus very often. I could have organized this workshop in Amsterdam, but I felt no, I felt very, um, I would say, determined to organize it at a location that would draw in different groups of people uh, and to talk about marginalized space at a space that's often felt as being rather marginalized. So, um, and then I think as well, the city of Skopje, where space has been taken over quite drastically, I would say, literally in the cityscape, as some of you might have already seen. So we felt it's fitting to organize it here, and we're glad you made the effort to come. I thought I'll say a little bit more about how we came here, because I already said it started a long time ago. It started with uh, a preparation of a research project uh, funded by HERA, and quite a few of the members are in the audience here today, so I'm very glad you made it as well. Um, when we were preparing a research project together with, uh, yeah, we are with five partners. I am based in Amsterdam. We have a team in Warsaw. We have a team in Italy, in Milan, um, Potsdam in Berlin, and Warsaw. I can see where Marco Jata is sitting now, but ah, yeah, at the back. So um, we came together and thought about creating a project which was, was called Encounter Points, a project that would um, really be about the renegotiation of belonging um, in different parts of Europe. So that was the main idea, and we started thinking about how to actually do this. Um, and we really thought we want to focus on the negotiation of culture through space and place and connect that to the wider field of culture, heritage and art. So that is what we all do in our research project. And like I said, particularly on those forms of belonging that are often marginalized. Huh? So quite a few of the other projects that we do focus, for example, on minority communities or focus on the colonial past or focus on uh, different urban landscapes that have changed quite drastically. So we really try to put that at the heart of what we do. Um, my own share of, of the project is the reason why we're here in Skopje, uh, because I focus in my research project on Southeast Europe and particularly on the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Northern Macedonia and Serbia. And I have uh, as my main goal, and I've been working on that for quite a while, which is also why I met Biljana at the first place, is to find out more about how grassroots cultural actors, organization, um, in very creative and innovative ways make use of cultural funding that is available. So that was the heart of my own um, project, and particularly to maintain spaces for critical debate and cultural interaction in circumstances that are rather challenging, you know, where there's not much possibility to do that. So this is what I've been focusing um, on. And so as a HERA team, we agreed, let's organize also a workshop around that theme, around how uh, we can think about new forms of governance, new forms of thinking about the creation of space and place in the European context, but in my case related to this particular region in Europe. My ambition was to take a practitioner's perspective. I think that's what we insisted from the first instance, to really talk with people that had experience actually doing what we've been, uh, been researching and to provide more input on how to preserve inclusive spaces in Europe. Um, we want to learn from each other, get inspired, um, I guess also remain a critical reading of what has been developed uh, in all these projects. Uh, and also, I guess, what are the wicked problems that we encounter? Huh? How can we solve them? Because we all have challenges in, in our development of this. So that has been at the heart of what we tried to do.
So yes, I got in touch with Biljana uh, at the start of the project and also with, at the time, Laila Hajic from Cultural Heritage Without Borders. And we started to thinking of how are we going to do this? And how are we going to arrange it? Like, two years um, ago, and started to make some concrete plans, because both Bilina and Laila were persons I really admired in their work in the region. I knew that they had good networks all over the region, and yeah, this was a good starting point before building, uh, building this workshop. Um, and so, and also we felt, yes, uh, Macedonia and Albania are also both countries, even within the region, that are often overlooked in the developments of these spaces. So uh, this, was, this was a part of what we were thinking. Um, so yes, I would say here we are today, uh, so, um, so I'm glad we made it uh, work uh, and to really think about uh, these spaces in which the general public can challenge their dissatisfaction and the like and to take that further here. Uh, and I think in particular in the context we are today uh, with, with the war starting uh, not so far from here, continuing challenges that we have with privatization, <coughs> neoliberalization, I mean it's still very central to invest in this freeing, liberating spaces, making sure that they are maintained and that they're preserved, which is uh, still very much at the heart of what Billion is doing and struggling with here in the Macedonian context. So we really hope um, to take this further today and uh, yes, to discuss this further with all of you. And uh, I pass over to Vidina here okay. to add to. Thank uh, you, Klaska. Yeah. Uh, I will welcome you again as a host <laughs> here <laughs> in Skopje. First, uh, I'm very well, uh, uh, I'm very happy that you're here in Skopje, that it's a city, once a city of solidarity. Uh, which was built after a devastating earthquake in 1963 that happened. So it was rebuilt in modernistic cities. Some of, uh, some of you had a chance to see, but also it's a city with uh, uh, modernistic architecture uh, that uh, was known uh, from the past. Uh, and this uh, is also uh, known by the a master plan of Kenzo Tange, for example, an architect that is uh, also famous by uh, renovating the post-war Hiroshima. He renovated, actually did this master plan for this city, which was, as I said, built uh, as a city of solidarity from uh, many different states all over the world. But also it's known as a city, unfortunately, as a Skopje 2014 city. That's the newest history that uh, we are not, some of us are not very proud of it. And also, uh, what to say, it's also another master plan, but it was a master plan to destroy this heritage of modernism that we had. So if you walk around the city, and uh, some of our actions, and also Klaske had the possibility to see it. We were starting with the kitsch tour that some of our activist friends were doing, and that was a walk through Skopje 2014 and through all this uh, scenography, I would say, of refurbishing the modernism into something that we call it antiquization of the city or neoclassicism that it doesn't belong to us, or at least some of us. And uh, what we're trying to do, it's also to create different belongings here, especially different belongings through cultural activities and through contemporary arts, especially because we are working in this field. So, as I said, um, one of these uh, actions of uh, uh, what we are doing in culture, and there were different, and I'm talking in the past, like Lokomotiva, it's now going to be 20 years of its existence, but there are many different organizations that are part of uh, this environment and trying to rebuild this space into a space of uh, contemporarity or a different belongings, as I said. So one of those uh, actions, what we took with our colleagues and uh, another colleagues in the field of performing arts, because we closely work in the field of contemporary performing arts. So we built or we tried to uh, make a space, project space for contemporary performing arts, and it was uh, called uh, Kino Cultura, project space for uh, contemporary performing arts and culture. 
So what is important here, we tried uh, this, uh, it was a building that was uh, built in 1939. Uh, it was a private building and after the Second World War it became a national space, national institution that uh, until 90s was existing as a cinema kinocultura. So it was a mapped uh, as one of the sites of the city that really kind of uh, tried to reimagine the city as urban city. So it has uh, different stories uh, that was coming up with this building. However, it was uh, taken back to the private owners in the 90s and it was denationalized. But we, as uh, cultural workers and artists, were trying to find this uh, space for performing arts for so long, uh, and we couldn't find another one, so we tried this to remake into a space uh, of performing arts. So we did that for five years, and we tried to give the different identity, but this was not only on the building, but mostly to the memory of uh, this heritage or of this uh, uh, site, I would say, urban site that was existing there. So, uh, what else? Uh, and uh, we met with Klaske there, exactly, on one of uh, the conferences that we did in this space, and it was dedicated on rethinking the models of uh, uh, cultural spaces back then in 2018. And uh, after that, uh, um, we have these two years of um, uh, pandemics. So, a lot of things changed. First, we had to uh, close the space. So we closed the space due to lack of finances, due to lack of political support or policy measures that would support this uh, space to grow up, to be developed, and etc. So we faced the challenges, as you were saying, all of you are seeing and in your cases. But uh, the best challenge or the worst challenge that we, or the closest challenge we faced, it was this pandemic. Uh, and then uh, for me, especially, and for us, it was a challenge to think of space and uh, on a spa public space totally differently. Why? Because uh, it was, uh, the public space was uh, almost dism uh, uh, dismissed, it was abandoned, or it was displaced into this digital space. But also what was important, especially in contemporary performing arts, dealing with the bodies, the proximity change, you know. So we had these two meters or the digital space there. So at these um, pandemic times also, and this loss of the space really learned us to think how to think differently maybe public space and the spaces in general and how we can recreate them in future. So we, what we gained there, so we questioned like what we gained there, what is the legacy what we have, what remains with this space and what is the heritage that we created there. So I would say probably the values that we produced through our actions, through what we did as a, a cultural uh, activists, cultural workers and an artist. So what I would say that it's uh, we strived uh, to create a space where we can care for each other because we created better conditions for work uh, and that was uh, a main thing for us. Also it was enabling people to create because uh, there are lack of spaces, especially here. Also, it was uh, enabling us to curate, uh, to produce different uh, uh, discourses also, and to uh, imagine different realities as a spaces or as a public sphere with this. So many different challenges are in front of us, especially now um, uh, how to continue further and how to put these values into frame now, into post, let's say, pandemic, but also with all these uh, uh, affections from the past uh, that we embodied and all this knowledge that we embodied uh, in the past. So that's it from the introduction. I really am very happy that we are a close proximity here and uh, I would like uh, to say a couple of uh, technical things is we are recording and I hope uh, 
everyone is okay with that. Uh, if not, please uh, tell us. And uh, also, I would like to thank everyone uh, from the team uh, of Klaske and uh, Lokomotiva, uh, Djurgica Hristovska, then uh, Blagica Petrovska, Zorica Zafirovska, Aisha, what was the Chubby, yes. Chubby. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank also Mkc that uh, enable us to have this space for us uh, to exchange and be together uh, and further on. Yeah. Okay, welcome again. <laughs> but then in the first panel, and um, th uh, I will be sure uh, that this panel uh, today shortly, it's about new forms of cultural intervention in public space. So I read carefully as Klaski also all the abstracts and I'm uh, very excited to hear more. Uh, and uh, here we can uh, talk on this panel about the new models of civil participation in governance, uh, promoting active citizenship and em emancipatory institutional transformation with focus mm -hmm. on existing and emerging models of innovative forms with examples in Croatia. But then we uh, also have the opportunity to listen about the tactical practices, uh, which is uh, you, yes, or you, okay. Uh, which is um, uh, using design to address issues of uh, marginality representation and test alternative processes uh, to include inclusion. So from participation that uh, Thea will talk in the governance, we will go to inclusive way and tactical uh, approaches and practices. And then we go uh, to see the practice of how to uh, remap or redesign the neglected urban spaces that are existing with this Opera Track project. And uh, that would be uh, uh, one, some of the points, but uh, afterwards uh, we will gladly discuss further on. Just shortly, I would like to say that there, uh, Vidović is comi coming from Kultura Nova Foundation, which is a specific foundation from the region. She will maybe say a few words more about. It's a civic public uh, cooperation, and she's the director of the foundation, but also uh, uh, this foundation is dedicated to civil society organizations in contemporary art and culture in Croatia. I would say that this foundation not only really kind of try to uh, reform the independent cultural scene or this uh, civil sector in Croatia, but very much uh, influenced the whole region and development of the sector. And uh, Francesca, also she works uh, on a different researches as a producer and et cetera. She is very active in finding a ways to support not only through Cultura Nova, but through joint uh, networks that we are doing in the region to support our regional work with, Kino uh, with uh, Cultura Nova, sorry. So, Francesca is coming from uh, Faculty of Architecture in Milan, and she's a researcher at uh, Politecnico di Milano, if I say it right. Uh, and uh, she studied their architecture, so she completed um, this double master program that she's, uh, uh, she did in Shanghai. This is a different perspective that she is bringing. Uh, and the other Francesca Sabatini is coming from Mediterranean University of uh, region of Calabria. And uh, she is currently a PhD candidate in cultural economics and a research fellow at the University of Bologna. But I will leave a space that you can meet them better through their presentation, but also through our social encounters further on. So please, there, if you can. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Bidena, so much. Can you hear me well? That's great. Uh, okay, so good morning, everyone. It's really such a huge privilege to broke this ice and to start uh, with this uh, uh, panel plenary discussion and then go uh, further in, in many details. So, um, 
I'm really happy that I'm here to share with you some of uh, Croatian practices within the public spaces based uh, on uh, participatory governance. And uh, I really would like to thank the organizer for this invitation and opportunity basically to be here finally in Skopje uh, after, uh, uh, after years of pandemic. Uh, so today uh, um, I will present the new models of governance uh, that appears across uh, Europe in the last uh, decades uh, as the traditional uh, governance system as well as a market-oriented system um, are not able to respond to the policy changes and different transformation of socio-economic environments. I will start basically my intervention with a really short video that will present one of the creation uh, uh, practices of uh, participatory governance with the example of uh, social cultural center Reutz in Pola. So I will just... Uh <coughs> za one koji nisu nikada bili u Puli i u Rojcu, to je jedna ogromni konglomerat, jedna ogromna zgrada u kojem egzistiramo i znači postoji suživot, stoji kažem tih devet udruga koje se bave različitim stvarima i to je u biti bogatstvo od tog Rojca, znači od sportskih, od djece do kulturnih, mislim nema šta nema u ovom Rojcu, znači to je jedan suživot koji je jedan grad u malom. Zapravo je Rojc ono mjesto gdje se pokreću nekakve pitanja, gdje se afirmiraju nekakve društvene inovacije i gdje ljudi pronalaze svoje mjesto. Od samog ulaska udruga u zgradu krenulo se znači sa obnovom prostora, udahnuo se neki novi život i kreativna energija. I još 2000-ih, na početku 2000-te godine su već počeli prvi koraci prema osnivanju nekakvog saveza, mreže, vijeća Rojca. 2008. onda se osnovala koordinacija, to neko nezadovoljstvo sa upravljanjem zgrade je kulminiralo. 2012. osnovan savez koji ima jako puno projekata, programa i sadržaja koji u stvari su baš za povezivanje svih udruga unutar Rojca s jedne strane, a s druge strane napokon neko može predstavljati Rojca. Mi u Rojcu imamo jedan model sudioničkog upravljanja u partnerstvu sa gradom Pulom koji je vlasnik zgrade. Ja bih očekivala više partnerstva u tom odnosu, ali on zapravo nije baš partnerski. Grad bi jednom trenutku trebao odlučiti i reći ok, organiziramo tijelo koje će upravljati Rojcem i nije nužno da gradska uprava ima zadnju riječ, neka bude član gradske uprave unutra i to je to sudioničko upravljanje, ali da onda ono što to tijelo odluči da se na takav način Rojc razvija. Povezivajući se u tom nekom neformalnom obliku, u nekim neformalnim akcijama, razgovarajući na kavi dok se radimo u vrtu ili nešto slično, sa jedne strane se povezujemo, s druge strane kreiramo zajednicu. Inače mislim da bi se sudioničko upravljanje moglo razvijati i na jednoj dubljoj razini na taj način da se više uključuju korisnici, i građani. Uloga grada treba u budućnost biti takva da shvati da će ljudi iz civilnog društva biti pametni i dobri gospodari i dobro upravljati zgradom. This is one of the video uh, which I show you uh, that produced by Kultura Nova and uh, we produced uh, six other videos uh, through which we present other creation examples of social cultural center and if you are interested in you can reach all that video via this uh, uh, link and of course we can share with you after the workshops here in Skopje. 
so uh, as I said, uh, uh, this example uh, from uh, Pula and Carlo Reutz is not the only Croatian example of this new practices of participatory governance in Croatia. We have uh, in many other cities, in Split, in Zagreb, but also in Dubrovnik, Karlovac, Čakovac, uh, Rijeka, and in some other cities as well. And these Croatian examples are not so unique, uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, not only only appear in Croatia, let's say, then it's uh, really uh, uh, appear all around uh, Europe in different countries, in Hungary, in Italy, in Austria, in Germany, in Serbia, and uh, I think as well something we have here in Macedonia, in, in Skopje, basically. Uh, so we are calling this uh, uh, um, cultural center as a new generation of the cultural center, and their main characteristic uh, is that uh, their results of uh, grassroots initiatives uh, that started reusing abandoned buildings and spaces trying basically to adapt uh, uh, those spaces to the new functions and accommodate it to the new users, let's say, and to share and use the spaces by many different beneficiaries based on the horizontal principles, peer-to-peer -peer relationship, but also shared uh, responsibilities. We can basically um, state somehow that uh, these uh, uh, emerging cultural centers are different uh, compared to the traditional or old uh, cultural center in a way that the traditional cultural centers uh, are results of top-down implementation, while this one is, as I said, results of bottom-up initiatives. Uh, the old traditional cultural center offer the right to culture for everyone, while the emerging cultural center is to basically offer a fair and equitable access to resources. So the old traditional cultural center, it's a provide the possibility for active participation in a cultural life, while another, this emerging cultural center, encourage citizens to participate in decision-making process. So this is the reason why we, uh, we can state that the traditional, the old cultural centers are made uh, uh, for people, while emerging ones are made uh, with the people. So what is the common for all of them? The, some kind of the concept uh, uh, or model developed uh, on the participatory governance uh, concept. But let's talk uh, firstly about the participation to understand what the participation is. So as we all know here that uh, participation has a really long tradition and uh, it's appear in a various geopolitical context. It's also results of the changes between the um, state and the citizens' relations. And uh, uh, it's a result of communications of and technology development. And because of all of that, today participation is not any more statistic and numeric concept. So basically, we faced uh, um, the shift to participation that started to appear in all areas. So we are live in an era that uh, um, we can say that it's a era of imperative of participation. So participation today is somehow the new poison uh, uh, or new opium for the people. But at the same time, it's a really important uh, to be aware of different kind of the limitation of participation. Uh, so the firstly, it's uh, there is a number of practices of participation with different layer of participation. So the crucial question is who participated, who is invited to, to the party, basically, and who decided, or who defines the rules of the game. So basically, the crucial question is who has a condition of possibility for participation. And all of this kind of uh, uh, limitation 
bring us to the key concern of participation that are basically blurring the lines between the participation and instrumentalization. So it's a really important to be aware uh, and to think about the distinction between the instrumentalization and tyranny of participation on one side and the real participatory practices on the other side. So there is a political interest uh, in participation participation that is not emancipating. It's a really much more easier to justify the public spending if the project gathered the larger number of, uh, of people. Uh, also, in many cases, the participatory promises are not fulfilled, so many user uh, uh, uses participation just as a starting idea uh, or as a, as a starting point uh, to get their idea, but then do not devote enough resources, enough uh, time, then enough attention to implement this uh, really complex and demanding uh, participatory process of citizenship engagement. And also, in a majority of cases, citizens' engagement does not mean serious uh, distribution of power and the resources. So it's a really important to be aware of these two main traditions and distinction between the sociological approach, which basically understand participation uh, dominantly as a start, uh, as a taking part in, while a political studies approach uh, count, let's say, on participation as a sharing power. All of that are bring us to this uh, ladder of citizens' participation made by Arnstein at the end of the 60s, which resonates still till today, and through which we can really recognize this layer of participation, which I mentioned earlier, from non-participation or manipulation and uh, uh, therapy to the uh, citizens' power, where basically the citizens' control represent the high level of uh, participation, which is resonate very well and linked to the concept of participation governance that appears at the end of the 80s in the Latin America in the third way of democracy and spread uh, very fast all over the world. But what the participatory governance is, it's a sharing governance uh, uh, responsibilities among different stakeholders from the public and the civil sector, but also from the private sector, and uh, created uh, opportunity uh, and empower citizens uh, for the decision making on a public issues. So the concept of participatory governance uh, basically created the solutions for the erosion of democratic vitality in this context of democratic deficit in which we live, where uh, the lack uh, uh, of uh, democratic institutions is all around. And this uh, also uh, created the solution for political passivity because uh, uh, the created possibility for the citizens to take the shift from being a passive observers and to become active decision uh, makers based on this decentralization of power structures and decision process. And this high, uh, higher democratized uh, model based on responsibility and common decision uh, making is uh, uh, result or related to the proposing solution on the public uh, problems. So basically the participatory governance, uh, it's uh, always related to the public realm and the public interest. But since we are talking about very complex, very demanding concept, it's uh, crucial to, uh, to be aware of many challenges and many of them we recognized during our research uh, of Croatian practices where we found that, uh, that uh, all participants, uh, all stakeholders uh, that are involved in the process uh, uh, do not share the equal, let's say, interest in participation. Uh, many of them are not familiar in the same way with the idea of uh, participatory go governance, so we faced uh, uh, the lack of understanding of the terms and the concept as well. All of that basically uh, influenced or created the 
increase the distrust uh, between the stakeholders. Uh, so many of them uh, basically see only the problems uh, uh, without perceiving the solutions, and specifically in the public sector within the civil servants. And let's say one of the main challenges is something what I already mentioned earlier, is this blurring the line between participation, instrumentalization, and the populism. Uh, so there is a no single blueprint or model or recipe with the ingredients uh, uh, which you can use and to cook and prepare your own practices. So the formula, one size fits all, doesn't work here. It's a really, you know, depends on the local context and what we can provide, let's say, it's a guidelines group of elements based on which uh, uh, another new initiatives can be inspired and tailored, developed their own practices depends on their local needs. So in the group of stakeholders, uh, it's really important to, uh, to, to have political support because, as I said, it's dealing with the uh, public realm. The commitment of all involved stakeholders, uh, it's also very important since uh, uh, they have different interests, different uh, expectations, as well as different uh, motivation. The time for participation of stakeholders uh, is also very important, uh, specifically when we tackle the stakeholders, the citizens as a stakeholders, because uh, they participate dominantly in their free time, let's say. And of course, the common language. Structure, network structure, creation of the bodies, and allocating uh, different responsibilities for different uh, bodies, uh, governing bodies, programming bodies, advisory bodies, and many other bodies, it's also very important. Defining of uh, pro procedures, different protocols for uh, uh, conflicts resolution, control mechanisms, sanctions uh, are also very important uh, for this process because the using a model of participatory governance is a process where the fail, it's a part of that process. And the openness to the newcomers is also very, very important part um, of the model. As my final remarks, uh, I wanted to stress uh, a different benefits for different uh, uh, perspectives or different aspects. So for the stakeholders, we can talk about the improvement of dialogue then the uh, level of cooperation, uh, but also rising a mutual understanding even uh, we also recognize the, this uh, uh, increasing of distrust among the stakeholders. For the society, it's uh, of course the creation of new values, new interactions, new relations that promotes coexistence and some kind of the, let's say, civic progress and created the, some positive changes within the society. When we tackle the realm of the public uh, uh, cultural of, of the cultural policy, we can say that the uh, participatory governance offer possibility to test with the new model of go governance and especially uh, the, uh, offer opportunity to rethink the role and the mandate of the public cultural institutions, which is really important in the context such as Croatia, where the public cultural institutions somehow lose their connections with the public uh, interest, uh, since they, in majority of cases, primarily reflect on the expert community instead of reflecting to the needs of the local uh, community. And uh, uh, the, the model of participatory governance provide the cultural policy frame um, distribution uh, of public resources in a much more appropriate way, uh, providing a wider access to the existing resources and also providing a transparent a transparency in realization of the of the goal. So I would say uh, that the participation is really not simple about uh, uh, joining in the game. It is also about having a possibility uh, to uh, uh, question the rules of that game. And for the end, uh, since. Uh, um, just a short explanation why Cultura Nova uh, tackled these issues of participatory uh, governance, uh, because uh, our beneficiaries, uh, uh, which are non-governmental, non-profit associations, uh, as uh, uh, Biljana 
stated earlier that work in contemporary arts and culture in uh, Croatia came to us uh, and asked uh, to uh, provide some non-monetary support for them within the uh, uh, model of participatory governance. Uh, why? Because uh, we also face the limitation of our budget through which we basically provided the grants and support their different practices uh, in contemporary arts and culture, including their practices and tendency within the participatory governance uh, uh, concept. And we decided to create this project, Approaches to Participatory Governance uh, of Cultural Institutions, uh, through which we conducted the research on the creation practices and tendencies and the results of that research we published in this book. Uh, I have a few copies here in English so if you are interested you can take but you can also download the, uh, the English version of the book uh, through Cultura uh, Nova website. Uh, we also work uh, in, uh, uh, in the field of increasing the visibility of the concept of participatory governance, uh, not only in Croatia, then also in the region, but also in the Europe. We participated in many different uh, European events. I can state at the end that Cultura Nova uh, contribute uh, to um, that, that participatory governance is not only the mere as experiment, that as a set, as a standard, either we are still pretty far uh, from that goals, but we are slowly, let's say, trying to reach that goals. And also, Cultura Nova um, advocated that basically help that the Ministry of Culture uh, um, implemented the call within the European Social Fund dedicated to participatory governance uh, practices and invested around 10 million euros in different practices that appear around Croatia, thanks uh, basically to advocacy led by Cultura Nova. And that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Lea. Yes, uh, the, the, the dramaturgy of this uh, talk is that everyone talks and then at the end we develop the discussion. So please uh, hold your questions and uh, we can talk later. So. so thank you so much for hosting this uh, great uh, meeting and uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really, really inspiring. I, I might have some questions later. Um, so I'm here on behalf of uh, Politecnico di Milano team. Uh, my other colleagues couldn't join, unfortunately, but um, so I will try to uh, guide you a bit into our research part as part of uh, Encounter Points uh, project. Um, so as also uh, I was introduced, so I'm an architect, and as uh, as an architecture team, we are researching specifically on the topic of tactical urbanism which is one label, but there are several labels uh, associated to this. So we have grassroots architecture, grassroots urbanism, DIY urbanism, so several names to identify more or less uh, the same kind of uh, initiatives, um, which specifically um, are uh, design-oriented or design-driven. Uh, so there is, of course, uh, a strong grassroots um, base, uh, but design and architecture are uh, guiding principles and guiding tools for these kind of initiatives. Um, and they are, so you can see that there is a strong uh, design and spatial uh, um, character uh, l guiding this and, and associating these different projects. Um, the main, uh, let's say, the main features that I try to, uh, to synthesize in this space is that uh, we focus, or tactical urbanistic interventions focus on the reuse of open spaces, neglected public spaces. Uh, so not so much buildings, uh, but more uh, cityscapes, uh, uh, neglected spaces. And uh, the characteristic of tactical interventions is that they try to share accessible tools uh, for intervene in these kind of spaces. 
and uh, to share tools for co-production and co-constructions of spaces and of interventions. And uh, usually teams are not, uh, thanks God, made only by architects, uh, but they try to be as much transdisciplinary as possible. So they involve sociologists, ethnographers, performers, uh, uh, which is a very fundamental aspect of this kind of projects. Uh, especially because architects usually don't know how to communicate with non-architects. Uh, so, uh, so I hope that I will be <laughs> as clear as possible in what I'm saying now. And other really important characteristic is that these interventions are usually cost effective. Uh, very often they are also reversible, so they are not permanent, they are temporary, but they try with temporary interventions to support and facilitate long-term processes. Um, long-term processes and something that also you were saying already so I will not uh, focus on this but compared to standard urban design tactical urbanism uh, tries to push for tactic versus strategy which is uh, two poles of the same uh, um, of the same topic and to to promote situated uh, interventions uh, versus generalized intervention. So a tactical urbanism is not looking at the master plan of the city, but it's really uh, focusing on acupuncture interventions dispersed within the cityscape. And to, and to promote decentralization instead of centralization uh, interventions uh, against this overall planning approach that uh, urbanism usually has. Um, so I will um, show you some example among our uh, broad panorama of case studies that we've been investigating uh, during the last uh, three years. Uh, so we took, <laughs> still feels weird, but it's three years. Um, so I took different examples to show you different situations because what is really interesting is that tactical urbanism usually uh, starts in many different ways. So there is, again, not one formula, there is not one recipe, uh, but we have different way of starting these kind of projects, different way of managing and producing and funding as well. So I will try to, uh, and I also try to, uh, to look for uh, different uh, uh, geographical context, because of course, geographical context uh, bring together alongside different policies and different uh, fundings and different also way of communicating and producing spaces. So the first one is uh, Le Gourmandie project in France. Uh, it started in 2015 and uh, it's, so it started from this association, Omaki, that was already present in the city and the village of Lori. Uh, and it was a citizen association that was already um, managing some activities and promoting some initiatives, uh, especially related to agriculture and farming and educational uh, activities. And uh, they asked, they literally contacted uh, Collective Etc., which is an architectural based collective, uh, and they asked for help to produce a space where this association could start these activities and these meetings. Uh, so to literally materialize a space, and, uh, and they started from this from this land with this abandoned old mill, and uh, the municipality was willing to help and support this project. So they allowed for a legal occupation of the space, and um, and of course, as as many of of this kind of project, it's it's simply started from uh, from meetings, from gatherings uh, around the table and uh, starting sharing ideas and, uh, and especially needs that the association wanted to, to promote. And what Collective Etc. Uh, carried out was a several small interventions, several small projects and activities and workshops, um, partially or, or mainly supported by the network of volunteers of the association Omaki uh, in the land, in this agricultural land and as well inside the old, this old mill. Um, so this is quite a clear example uh, how uh, from this co-construction workshop these kind of projects are then carried out and developed. So the production of an object, of an architectural object, of a design element is the occasion to bring people together, to share tools and share knowledge about taking care of space, building space collectively. And then through these very hands-on activities, the, the, collec the collectivity and the community is really uh, gathered and, uh, and 
So they, they built an open space, but also they reused this old mill. And they could, in this way, they could really materialize a physical space where they could recognize themselves as an association and also to carry on these educational activities, not just during the summer, but also during the winter. So, so in this sense, this is a clear example of a project that started by a citizen association and that was managed, and it's still managed through volunteer work, but, and it was fully supported by the mutualism and recycle. So in this, in this specific case, there was no really like public fundings or money involved, but mainly help and volunteer and mutualism and recycle, especially of material, which is uh, often uh, a trend in this kind of, uh, of interventions. Um, the next project is set in Italy. Uh, but it's a collaboration between Italy and Germany. Um, so it started from this Ammirato Culture House, which is again an association, mixed cultural and citizen association. And uh, the really interesting thing is that uh, this association was already using an abandoned building uh, together with this free home university, uh, which is actually led by an organization which is based in Canada. So this starts already from like kind of network of different cultural institutions working together and reusing this abandoned building um, with the, of course, not illegally occupied, but with the authorization of the municipality. And uh, their, um, their will was to start uh, reusing this kind of courtyard garden. Um, what it stated in their project is that they have been trying before to reuse this space for a very long time during summer, always with little initiatives, performances, uh, workshops, but it never managed to, to stick to the place. So every time they had to restart because there was, they didn't have the right tools or knowledge to actually renovate the space in a clear and stable way. So they involved Construct Lab, which is a collective base in Berlin, a uh, really big collective every time they are like there are new uh, partners joining so it doesn't have really a shape and the collectivity uh, feature is kind of like characterizing all the different architectural practices involved in this kind of project so we always talk about collectives rather than studios and it's always a collective which is uh, where different forces are joining and um, Similarly to what Collective Etc. did in the previous project, they also organized a series of, uh, of workshops. Uh, so uh, with, the, with the association of Giardino Mirato, they uh, produce a program of events, but also a program of little design and construction workshop to appropriate the space. So they involved the migrant community of Lecce and also the citizens of the neighborhood in this uh, hands-on production of the space and gardening activities. And this process of construction, of co-constructions, helped to involve the citizen in taking care of the space. So in a way, this learning by doing and uh, learning by taking care of the space and producing the space helped the association to really engage the, the citizen and the neighborhood uh, in this project, which is still alive so it's still working so finally the fact of producing an element that you then have that you produce and you have to take care of help the people to to get uh, engaged in the space and affected to it and compared to the previous one um, uh, in this case there were art foundation and public fundings uh, involved in the production of the elements um, this one is set in Italy, Aprilia, it's just outside of Rome. It's already itself a neglected uh, town or a neglected uh, satellite city outside of Rome. Um, and it started, this is quite interesting because in Italy it's not, it doesn't happen so often actually. So it started from a national idea competition where uh, uh, MIBACT and uh, CNAPPC, they are two uh, Italian uh, institutions, uh, they did this call, this idea competition, to ask municipalities around Italy to propose sites for renovation. And Aprilia proposed uh, this site together with Horizontale, which is this collective of architects based in Rome, and Noir. So I was saying Horizontale, the collective of architects, and then Oio sociologist group, and Walls and Art Collective. So they, they joined together and they made this proposal for the regeneration project of this uh, square, which is this empty lot. 
Um, so Aprilia is a neglected uh, city outside of Rome, and this is even more neglected space inside of Aprilia. So what you see in the corner is this uh, um, residential uh, building, and this green area that you see that might look nice, uh, it was not so nice, uh, so it, it was meant to be in the, or, in the original project when this residential building was built, it was meant to be a um, market square with the parking underneath. And then it didn't work out because the fundings uh, finished, uh, so they retried to, they made like several propositions during the decades because it's, uh, it's a residential building from the 60s. So nothing happened, it remained like this, and of course it created a very bad situations around and inside. And, um, and thank fortunately, uh, this idea competition was won by this group of, uh, of designers and sociologists and, and everyone. And, um, they, but the interesting thing is that they simply didn't propose an urban redesign of the space, but they proposed a three years long process of like a participatory process. So that started with the basic urbanization of, the, of this green area. Uh, so basically just preparing a pavement and, and steps because it's, uh, it's a reset uh, from the street level. And then and, and they propose a full program of uh, workshops and, uh, and again uh, art and of course uh, meetings with, uh, with citizens and, and painting workshops to, to really re revitalize this, this area through this long process. And, and also building little installations inside, also temporary installations inside the square, um, to again um, really try to, to produce a sort of educational process. Because the, the, the main issue was not just that the place was ugly, but that the people around feel really detached from the space, and, uh, and they really they didn't feel any sense of belonging to the space and all the projects and the proposals that were made during the, during the years were not really perceived uh, from, from the citizens and with this project now they really managed to involve uh, the residents in taking care of the space and using the space but it took quite a long time with COVID in the middle so it was even which which actually in a way helped because it made the project even longer mm -hmm. and they had more time to um, to bring people inside the space. Uh, in this case, there were public ins uh, public fundings and, and national funding, so it was, of course, uh, a, a big uh, a big project. And usually, these interventions, as you may have seen in the other, are usually wooden structures, very small structures, reversible. So this was a mix of an actual urban intervention with small tactical um, design interventions. And the last project is um, in Portugal south of Lisbon, also a bit peripheral area. Um, in this case, Atelier Mob, uh, which is an architectural collective, was invited by this group of uh, university and cultural institutions to intervene uh, in, uh, in this neglected area, which is Terra da Costa. Uh, it's an uh, informal settlement built in Almada in an agricultural land and in this in this case uh, the project was funded and promoted by the Kulbekin Foundation uh, through a um, yeah, health and food program so this, this you see more or less is this self-built informal settlement by agricultural uh, and, and farmers workers and what Atelier Mob, together with Collective Warehouse and the universities, what they did was to, again, have meetings with, uh, with the residents and to understand what was the real need of the space and of the community itself. So if in other cases, like the previous one you saw, uh, a collectivity or a community was already uh, already knew what they wanted in a way. In this case, the process really helped and served to, to make people understand what was useful for them um, because they, they more or less had what they needed. They had their own houses, which they built, and they already had a job and everything, but there was no, of course, public building in this informal settlement. Um, so all the work that they did, uh, especially meeting them and uh, walking around and staying with them in the space, helped them to understand that they needed a kitchen. Uh, and in a way, what is, what is interesting is that this co a community kitchen actually was somehow an excuse, actually, to bring water and electricity to the site. 
So compared to the other example, this is quite, uh, quite special because it is a really marginal community. Um, but it, what, what is interesting is that in this case, architecture served as an infrastructure for basic needs and also for the community to, uh, to manifest and promote their identity. Uh, so it's a mixed community of different ethnic groups, uh, all marginalized groups, and the community kitchen became uh, a way to, to promote and to, um, yeah, to promote their presence and, uh, and to regain also, uh, in a way, confidence about them being them and, and claiming the right to the place uh, um, and to the space. Um, this project, compared to the others, has some issues because, of course, being a sort of little building, someone really needs to manage it. And, and in this case, architects still have to support the process because the community, of course, is having major issues than managing the space. So it's, uh, but it's triggering uh, really relevant um, uh, questions. So just to uh, briefly uh, close. Um, Especially after, so talking with practitioners, so with the designers, and also during our policy uh, brief workshop we had uh, some, some months ago, uh, some main questions emerged or, or necessity emerged from the designer point of view. And one thing is to um, the, the need to rethink public competitions when it comes to uh, the reuse of open public spaces. Uh, the little symbols you will see are actually uh, good examples of, of these. Uh, solved needs. Um, so do we need to, to redesign public competitions? So the competition, for instance, uh, that promoted this uh, project in Aprilia was a good example because it allowed for designers to actually design the process of intervention and not simply design a space, but really rethink all the steps of the competition. What do we really need? So maybe a competition mm -hmm. shouldn't already tell what needs to be done, but should question what needs to be done, which seems like uh, obvious for architects, but uh, it's, it's not at all. Uh, need to promote more co-management strategies through policies, um, especially, I mean, the difference between open spaces and buildings is that, of course, they, they need different policies and different strategies of reuse. Uh, when it comes to open spaces, it might seem a bit easier because you don't need, like, it's a different way of occupying the space. Um, but again, when it comes to open spaces, you, you need to, uh, to establish certain ways of occupation and to allow for people to use it and occupy it legally. So this is, uh, and for instance, the Amministrazione Condivisa dei Beni Comuni in Italy, it's a good, it's a good tool. Uh, it's still in the process of development and improvement, but it's, it's a good one. I think maybe you, you know more about this and you can tell more. Um, need to promote decentralization through fundings. Uh, BIPSIP is a Portuguese uh, program which is really, really important. And in, it promotes these fundings in collateral and peripheral area, areas. And it tries to like break down fundings and not uh, centralize them only in nice central public squares, uh, but to also promote the reuse of these neglected uh, hybrid spaces. And they need to promote self-management through education and tools. Making Future is a project uh, promoted also uh, by Raum Labor in Berlin. And, uh, and it's also a way to really learn by doing and, uh, and teach citizens and associations how to reuse and redesign spaces and also matching formal and informal uh, institutions way of learning. And, and the last thing is to uh, need to provide support and network, especially when it comes to uh, learning about fundings and, and policies and bureaucracy. And JECO is another, um, um, Generative Commons is another project, Horizon 2020. Uh, and one of the practices uh, we analyzed was part of this. It's Gravalos uh, di Monte, Patrizia di Monte. Uh, so she also brought this, her knowledge about this. Uh, but it's again like really the need to establish these networks of mutualism and exchanging resources and knowledge when it comes to practices of reuse. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. I am uh, usually the translator of the architects, that's Francesca Sad, because I'm right in the middle um, of the different backgrounds, because like uh, I've been working uh, with architects 
throughout my PhD and my uh, research fellowship at the University of Bologna now. Um, but I also am a practitioner and an activist. Uh, um, I used to work um, for the project uh, that I'm going to present to you uh, today uh, for uh, Opera di Roma. And therefore, I sort of fit in between um, many of the things that have been mentioned earlier, um, which makes me very happy about the way this session has been arranged, because I guess there is a lot to uh, discuss in the upcoming uh, minutes. <coughs> All right, so as you see, I have a thing for long titles, so I'd rather, like, rather than providing you with like, a rich literature background, I'm gonna go through very, uh, very shortly the glossary um, um, that I'm using to provide you with some uh, context of the examples I will be discussing. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I am dealing uh, with urban voids. It is something that has been mentioned earlier in different terms. Um, a urban void is a space uh, that it has been uh, devoid of meaning and function, um, but that, um, and the, the fault, the, the cause for that uh, is the uh, massive urban transformations that cities have been uh, uh, going through probably ever since the uh, Industrial Revolu uh, Revolution, if not even longer, um, that have left um, in the aftermath uh, uh, massive consequences, especially in the way cities have been built and shaped, uh, so that we have ended up um, having these large uh, brownfields, large uh, open spaces and in-between spaces uh, um, that have been deprived uh, of their original function, uh, have found it, have struggled to find an original function um, due to lack of administrative support, uh, due to a detachment of the community from uh, uh, from the values that it used to have, um, due to a, a whole new economic redevelopment uh, of, uh, uh, of the areas uh, in the uh, post-industrial era, for example. Um, and nonetheless, these spaces uh, have potential uh, because they are large, because they are um, close to marginalized communities. Therefore, they have the uh, potential to be properly outfitted uh, to uh, achieve new value. Um, what can give, give them this new value? Uh, among the answers, uh, as uh, Francesca was uh, beautifully illustrating earlier, uh, there are many examples of how these spaces uh, uh, can be used. Uh, but the uh, type of answer that I uh, am giving to this question specifically um, is that of cultural participation. Uh, um, also, as, as has been mentioned earlier, this has many um, layers, uh, many controversies uh, that are linked to cultural participation. Um, and nonetheless, the meaning that uh, I am giving to cultural participation here is that of uh, cultural opportunity and cultural capabilities, meaning that uh, people can um, finally be reconnected maybe with culture because they had been uh, segregated from it and by cultural capabilities uh, uh, it is often meant that people can develop capabilities that are linked to a cultural experience uh, um, and maybe achieve like some social capital by a proximity exercise through culture um, therefore Cultural participation is here intended as the possibility um, not just to co-produce culture, but maybe to also share um, the spaces of culture. Um, because what I often find in the uh, discussion on cultural democracy, for example, and cultural participation is most often about policy, which is very far distant from, uh, uh, from communities. So whereas I think that um, cultural participation and cultural democracy uh, really are a matter of space um, because policies often focus uh, on uh, institutionalized places and subjects uh, rather than on uh, spaces that can be reappropriated. Uh, and therefore, shifting the focus uh, to culture as a special matters, uh, matter is really um, relevant, I guess, to the discourse uh, of uh, um, urban regeneration. Which leads me to my third point, that is the temporary reactivation uh, through cultural participation practices of the urban voids. Um, because like this transformation, uh, the, the use of uh, spaces for cultural activities doesn't have to be forever. Um, especially because we have seen that um, the massive transformation, like the massive reconstruction and uh, restructuring of entire neighborhoods uh, has often had enormous social costs that are not 
very much accounted for in the uh, balance scorecard of these uh, uh, of these projects. Uh, we often see. Uh, I'm thinking of the Guggenheim model, for example, in Bilbao, which has supposedly led to a flourishing and the thriving of the economy of Bilbao, which had restructured, uh, which had. I mean, in the post-industrial era, had gone through a period of crisis, but at the same time, this again has happened and at a very hard uh, social cost. So uh, there has been a standardization of the uh, cultural richness of the area and a very strong process of gentrification. So we have seen that uh, whenever massive reconstruction through culture happens, the, this, the famous culture-led urban regeneration has often had more um, controversies than benefits for, uh, uh, for communities. Therefore, the temporary reactivation uh, can be a way even of prototyping, even of testing uh, what the potential use of an area might be, and, uh, um, and maybe even suggesting new uses for the, uh, for the communities. So what I'll be focusing on um, here is a, um, is a project that, that has had very different develop developments in different cities, um, and which shows the, the character of uh, temporality. It is a very, um, it is a project which has had um, a very temporaneous effect uh, in uh, uh, some cities uh, and some long-term effects uh, uh, in others, but which nonetheless suggest um, that cultural uses uh, can be a, a way of reactivating uh, urban voice without uh, the social cost that I, that I was mentioning, and even uh, without massive infrastructural uh, investments, uh, even though, of course, this approach has some limits uh, that I would love to uh, discuss later uh, in the session. So the project is called uh, Opera Camion, uh, that literally means opera truck. Um, it is a truck that had been touring Roman, uh, like Italian peripheries uh, since 2016, um, and which is literally consists of a truck that uh, comes to peripheries um, in different cities um, of Italy and performs opera for free in public space uh, for citizens. Um, even though, as I was saying, it has had very different developments in different cities, uh, some characteristics uh, are uh, always present. One of them is that the performance is always entirely free, so people um, do not need even a ticket to attend, so any barrier is entirely torn down. Um, it has a specific relationship with the unbuilt space, because it is never um, set in a theatre. Um, in Rome, this has happened sometimes uh, for matinee performances for children. For example, they have been used in a small theater uh, to bring opera camion to children. Um, but the core focus uh, is always on uh, public spaces, neglected public spaces, because 99% um, of the performances, except for the Reggio Emilia case, which I'm going to show very briefly, um, has occurred in peripheries. So in uh, former parking lots, uh, in, abandoned, uh, uh, in abandoned spaces, in brownfields, industrial brownfields, uh, um, etc. And uh, there is always uh, an element of co-production, which is very slight in the uh, Reggio Emilia case uh, and is a lot stronger, for example, in the Palermo case. Um, so as I was saying, uh, Opera Camion has lasted for, uh, for four years. It was then interrupted uh, by the pandemic. It was started um, by uh, Opera di Roma in Rome, but then it, it achieved a life of its own because the creative team um, has started to develop uh, different partnerships uh, uh, with different theaters. So it has sort of become, again, an evolving form format uh, modulated on, um, on different cities, which makes it sort of uh, uh, scalable and ad adaptable to the different needs uh, and context uh, where it has been uh, placed. Um, it has staged four different productions, uh, which, as you will see shortly, are characterized by a very strong uh, degree of uh, uh, artistic innovation, uh, which is fairly weird, uh, especially because we are discussing an opera truck. I mean, it's a truck, but it's still opera, which is the most conservative, probably, form of art, uh, um, not, not, not only in Italy, uh, and which nonetheless here um, has been given the freedom to be adapted and transformed um, throughout the years and to achieve some very special and unique features. Um, it has toured uh, 17 different cities uh, in Italy, some of them very peripheral, so it did not just deal with peripheries, uh, the outskirts of the cities, uh, but also um, like 
periphery in the broader sense, so rural areas, uh, the areas that had been struck by the 2017 earthquake uh, in Italy. Uh, therefore, it has really brought um, cultural opportunity to, uh, to what can really be considered marginalized communities uh, all over Italy. Um, in particular, uh, in the case of uh, Rome, which was the initial uh, development of the project, it has covered all of the uh, um, Roman municipia, that is like the municipalities uh, uh, of Rome, and some of them have been uh, um, covered several times, uh, so that a sort of uh, recurrence uh, um, has been gained for uh, those peripheries. So, since, since it doesn't have ticketing, um, it's not possible to make an exact estimate of how many people have attended, and nonetheless, uh, um, an attempt has been made. So, uh, it is uh, estimated that more than uh, 25,000 people have attended Opera for free, uh, thanks to Opera Camion, 15,000 people in uh, Rome only. The three models that I was discussing uh, earlier um, are those of Reggio Emilia, um, of Rome, and of uh, Palermo, and specifically of uh, uh, Danisini, which is a neighborhood uh, in Palermo with some very peculiar characteristics, uh, which I will show you uh, very briefly. So, Opera Camion in Reggio Emilia was staged in September 2020. I don't know if that rings a bell for you in the calendar. Um, it was one of the very few uh, live performances uh, uh, that were held uh, in Italy during the pandemic. Um, so it was sort of a very um, brave operation, uh, if you will allow me, uh, of reappropriation of uh, urban public spaces and spaces of sociability um, right after the pandemic. So in a period in which restrictions were easing be because contagions uh, uh, were luckily lowering, um, the artistic director of the, of the theater dared to occupy the, uh, the space. And uh, um, of course, some of the characteristics uh, of uh, the other two models uh, were not present, uh, as you will see later. So seats were put orderly in a row in front of the square uh, of the Reggio Emilia Theater. Um, people had to, um, to order a ticket, even though it was free, so they had to somehow restrict the access. Uh, there was somehow this uh, like small barrier, and like barriers were also put in order to avoid, uh, I mean, overcrowding, of course, in the in the theater. And nonetheless, uh, what was really interesting, uh, there were two main interesting aspects. Uh, the first was that um, the um, the director said that he would have never, if it wasn't for the pandemic, if it wasn't for the occasion of actually reappropriating uh, public space for the citizens, he would have never done it because uh, the uh, opera lovers, uh, people who are obsessed with opera, the logionisti would have pissed him off um, otherwise because uh, it has a strong musical tradition that would have hindered somehow the artistic experimentation if it wasn't uh, for the specific occasion of actually occupying the, uh, the square with citizens. And the second interesting aspect uh, was that um, the project somehow catalyzed uh, sociability even uh, despite restrictions, so because even though people had to buy a ticket, there were uh, like couples of elders uh, and couples and like people still gathering outside the barriers, uh, bringing their own seat from home and attending the performance uh, uh, anyways. So it was sort of uh, an irresistible moment uh, for uh, uh, both witnessing um, a cultural performance uh, and uh, uh, being together after uh, such a long time. The Opera Camion experiment in Rome uh, was the um, most classical, at least in my perspective, because it was the initial one. And uh, it was conceived, again, to cover uh, spaces in peripheries, as you have seen uh, from the Reggio Emilia model. Um, the performance had occurred uh, in a very central square, but in, a, in an amazing, in an exceptional occasion uh, that was uh, um, a reopening after COVID. In this case, uh, there was no COVID performance, uh, but the uh, truck had been touring uh, Roman peripheries from 2016 to 2019 um, in uh, very unexpected spaces. Uh, it arrived in the afternoon. Um, um, actors uh, and singers uh, started to animate the square somehow before the performance. Uh, so they started going to bars, for example, to talk um, to the people, attracting them somehow to witness the performance. Uh, and then the most interesting um, aspect uh, was that people had could at least uh, attend entirely for free. Uh, and the only condition was that they uh, brought their seat from home again. So in that case, it was sort of mandatory to either bring your seat from home, sit on the ground, uh, um, and uh, 
somehow co-construct the theatrical space uh, in the um, in the urban void. So it, of course, it doesn't have a degree, the degree of co-construction uh, that you would expect in tactical urbanism, but it was somehow the reproduction of public space and the uh, reproduction of the theatrical space uh, um, that uh, mattered together, of course, with the cultural opportunity um, while collecting interviews. Uh, so many of the interviewees said, I had always dreamt of uh, going to Carcalla, which is the uh, Roman baths, uh, where the, um, the summer season of the opera theater takes place. And finally, Caracalla has come to me. So people were uh, excited about uh, um, being able to come uh, to be together, because as you will see in the video that I will be shortly displaying, um, any type of thing occurred. I mean, people went there with their grandmas, with their children. Uh, they brought large bowls of pasta to eat together during the performance. Uh, and uh, um, what was also interesting was that the uh, performance, the, the uh, audience was a lot louder, of course, than you would expect in a normal theater. So they had like the fact of not having special barriers uh, and somehow um, a rule of access uh, uh, preventing them from having biases and from feeling unwelcome in that space. So they also reappropriated the, um, the cultural heritage that we always discuss about that, that somehow um, could have not been accessed probably otherwise, not just because of the economic barrier, once again, but because of the, the spatial barrier. So I'm going to be shortly displaying the video that I was telling you about. was working there it was great to see inflatable crocodile center the theater when they were rehearsing so it was uh, we'll, we'll discuss about the the um, artistic innovation element a little later because it's also about like not just what art can give to space but also what space can give to art in this sense so um, that was a very interesting aspect the third model um, is a little more more peculiar, uh, and uh, I wasn't actually looking for this when uh, I sort of bumped into it. It was sort of a research situation, as they say in grounded theory, because uh, I was looking for uh, um, to see how uh, Opera Camion had developed uh, in Palermo, because it, like in 2017 it became a co-production uh, with Opera di Palermo. Um, but what actually happened in Palermo was that after a first year of tour um, of Opera Camion, uh, the tour stopped permanently in the Danisini neighborhood because something happened there. Um, first of all, Danisini is a very, um, has a very weird configuration because it can uh, fully be considered a periphery, but at the same time, uh, and it's full of urban voids, but at the same time it is very central, so it is not far from the Norman Palace, so it is right in the heart of the city center, but because of this uh, cul-de-sac structure that has a single entrance uh, and this little square and lots of informal housing all around. Like if you try to uh, reach one place, uh, fr to go from one place to the other, Google Maps wouldn't suggest you to go through the, uh, the street that people in the Danifini neighborhoods have built because um, it is as if they weren't there. So it's uh, urban void in the literal sense of the term. It does not exist. Um, when the Opera Theatre uh, went there and they said, hey, we want to perform Opera Camion in the space, 
um, in, in your square, they said, no way. Um, this would be a shopping window for the theater showing how good you are, how mercy you are to come in a periphery and uh, perform for free for us. Um, either you uh, give, give us something in return, something that provides value. This is what um, people told me um, in Danisini, uh, or you change the square. And miraculously, I would say, the theater said, OK, let's negotiate what you want. And the performance eventually became a co-production with the uh, local population. So uh, people were staged as the choir of the performance. If the video has downloaded, I will show it to you um, um, in a while. Um, and the place where it happened uh, uh, is of a very special sort, because uh, the community of Danisini was strong enough to ask for the theater, to the theater for a negotiation, uh, because they had already started a pro, uh, like a grassroots movement uh, to actually reappropriate the neighborhood slowly. It had started in 2013 when the administration wanted to demolish uh, the kindergarten, and they opposed the decision and asked uh, that the kindergarten um, be res uh, restored somehow, so that it could welcome children again. Um, because it has an immense, like Danisini has an immense school dropout rate, uh, an immense unemployment rate, uh, so it has a very uh, critical situation. After that, uh, they asked that the um, the terrain where they wanted, where the administration wanted to build a parking lot, um, could become um, a park for the citizens. And in fact, they started um, building. This, uh, this park that you see in the above picture, um, which is now a, um, a vegetable garden that is uh, uh, cultivated by volunteers and by people um, who would otherwise go to prison. It's an alternative uh, measure to detention. Um, they were able to build um, the um, a sort of a theater, it's a tent, a circus tent, where that is shared by a group of amateur uh, performers by the Opera Theater when it started to develop uh, Opera Camion there, and by um, circus, uh, uh, circus groups that stop by and then uh, perform in Danisini. And so progressively, they started appropriating uh, the, the place. And after they had established their presence there, they started slowly welcoming outside cultural institutions uh, in the area. So they knew that they couldn't provide cultural resources all by themselves. Um, but at the same time, uh, they wanted a moderate entrance to moderate the entrance of cultural institutions in their space. Um, this is what happened with, Opera di, with uh, Opera di Palermo, but at the same time also with the uh, School of Fine Arts and uh, um, with the Teatro Biondo, that now has an amateur lab um, of theater, whereas the um, Fine Arts School contributed to creating uh, a social open-air open museum um, that is worth a view, indeed. So. I don't like the word impact, uh, it's very uh, strong, it's not what art should be making really, but uh, they're actually where um, some things that we can consider impact even though we don't measure them um, with numeric indicators. Um, people, as I was saying, um, really felt that this was an occasion for uh, uh, socializing not only with people from the neighborhood, but also with the artists. Um, because it was a very open and informal um, uh, way of performing, uh, and people and actors were around uh, even before the performance, uh, so they were somehow, um, they felt closer to the uh, form of art as well to the people um, who make it. This leads me directly to the third um, point, actually, which is uh, uh, the relationship between the informality of the space uh, and uh, um, artistic freedom. Uh, they sort of went together because the theater and the performance performers uh, would have never felt so free uh, to uh, improvise because there were some like many improvisations throughout the whole um, experience uh, that people uh, related directly to things that were happening uh, live. There was a lot of more interaction directly with the audience uh, and uh, some people even mentioned the fact that they felt that they were giving uh, the performance as a gift to specific members of the audience because they could look at them in the face. Uh, and similarly, the audience uh, felt a lot more free to intervene, uh, to burst out in exclamations, etc., than they would have ever, ever done in, in a theater. Um, on spaces, uh, again, like the levels, as I was saying, were manifold. So in Reggio Emilia, um, 
it was l really just a temporary reappropriation, whereas in Rome, for example, um, the transformation was uh, um, was existed even though it was not uh, it was not permanent. But for example, the lighting system had to be uh, rearranged uh, by the municipality before the theater came. Um, even the uh, theater company started collecting, for example, the shreds from the uh, from the square with the community prior to the performance, uh, um, activating a sort of a caretaking activity um, altogether. The um, the grass was uh, was mound so that um, there was a temporary, at least a temporary. Um, um, upkeep of the space, um, whereas in Danisini, of course, the transformation was more permanent uh, um, because, again, the electrical system was made and then uh, uh, some like wooden platforms uh, were made uh, that could welcome performances uh, as well as uh, um, labs, uh, for example, for the Danisini community outside of the uh, moment of the performance, um, which is inscribed once again in the whole, um, um, in the whole renovation process that Danisini has gone through. And speaking again of people, um, there was uh, uh, like the involvement of children, for example, was uh, was prominent, especially in Danisini. So that, uh, for example, children that were diagnosed with uh, ADHD uh, eventually um, weren't uh, in the following year because of the constant presence uh, um, of the community around them to develop cultural activities uh, uh, together. And then and uh, Opera Camion was part of the process. Um, and speaking of capabilities, uh, uh, lots of children uh, um, eventually started uh, joining the children lab uh, in the theater, in the Teatro Massimo uh, theater for uh, uh, dancers uh, and for uh, a, the children choir um, after the experience. Implications for governance uh, um, regard mainly the um, the role of, uh, of the theater as sort of a mediator um, between the community, their own space, uh, and even the local administration, because of course uh, um, this helped uh, um, assert sort of their um, um, their presence over the territory. They acted as sort of a guarantor. Okay, can't play. That is too bad. <laughs> It was an interesting clip because you can really see, uh, as, as you can see, like Danisini is a semi-rural space, uh, so there's gardening, uh, there are goats in the background while people are singing, so you have, um, you have opera singers uh, singing in front of uh, gooses and goats and uh, like all, all sorts of animals, uh, and uh, then you have the amateur choir, uh, which does an amazing job actually in the, um, in the performance. Of course, uh, I'm not saying that the project is perfect, and I really wanted to discuss, uh, obviously, the limits. Um, the first uh, limit is that of structural barriers and institutional frictions, because not everyone in the theater wanted the performances uh, uh, to happen, not even among the artists. And, like There were some of them who perceived um, a lowering of the level of the, of the performance uh, and of the artistic quality because of the artistic innovation uh, of the fact that the performance couldn't be perfect because it was set in the uh, in the open space. Um, structural barriers also include the fact that um, the Italian funding for the performing arts uh, does not fund this type of activities because they do not produce tickets, which is weird because they should precisely fund the activities that do not produce tickets because the others can somehow self-fund themselves. Um, this is uh, somehow changing, but like theaters are arranging themselves. They're trying to uh, find other ways of funding uh, the, these types of performances, these types of projects, uh, because the Ministry uh, for the Performing Arts uh, will not. Um, the temporary reactivation and, uh, regen and, and urban regeneration, of course, are not on the same level. Of, so like these are temporary interventions. So they can somehow elicit care, elicit sociability, and even provide cultural opportunities for all in ways in which Massive transformations uh, usually cannot, but still, um, it is very hard to say whether these experiences are here to last and produce uh, a long-lasting effect on the community and on spaces. Uh, so, um, uh, even though I consider them crucial experiences, uh, uh, I am aware that they are not um, as permanent, of course, uh, as a, an infrastructural investment. And conclusively, in the specific case of Danny Sinmi, um, this, um, this amazing experience uh, has managed to survive because of the support of the local administration uh, that has uh, um, allowed them to use those spaces uh, and to respond to their uh, initiative. But this is, this is not always so. 
um, when discussing about the urban commons, uh, one of the main principles is the minimal recognition of the rights to organize, and this might not, not always be true uh, when the local administration changes uh, and uh, uh, the elections might bring a new major mayor with new other priorities in his or her agenda. I am leaving here uh, some resources that, that I'm, I'd be happy to share with you also later. Um, the Danisimi uh, community has a website. They have organized themselves in an association in order to respond to tenders, uh, which is interesting because, uh, as we were saying, um, it is still very hard for uh, uh, informal groups of citizens uh, to actually um, respond to calls for projects. So, for example, the, the um, ministerial way of, uh, uh, of preparing calls is still not very responsive to this type of new emerging organizations. And the website of Opera di Roma uh, shows you some pictures uh, and there are some other videos uh, other than the one uh, that I showed you. And then the director of the project, uh, Fabio Kersich, uh, has a website where he um, shows uh, the work that has been done uh, with both the Danisini community and the uh, choir lab and the rest of the, um, the, rest of the project. So thank you. I hope I didn't um, hear you. Thank you so much. I didn't uh, measure time because we had uh, this one, uh, this uh, time for us. And also later we will have this round table where we can continue the discussion. So therefore, I was not cutting you <laughs> in this matter. And uh, firstly, uh, I would like to invite you uh, to have a voice. And uh, also you, maybe, as a participants in the panel, you can ask the questions between uh, yourself before uh, me posing the questions. So, please, now I open the discussion and I would like to ask uh, uh, Anna Zuvela to uh, kickstart, yeah, to kickstart to get the first question. Yeah. Italy has been very so inspirational to many European countries when researching the use of space collaborative and commoning sort of practices. It is the first country where we actually encountered mutualism in our research in the way community contributes to the revitalization of the space, to different forms of infrastructure, even if they land electricity power and different, it's amazing examples. But what I wanted to ask you, these tactical, like in our research, we've gathered that these initiatives do not actually have their regulative and policy space still. They're just happening. So my first question will go to that line. Tactical urbanism, how does it translate to policy language and to policy regulations? And that's on, on a practical level. And on the second level, on a more meta level, do you perceive through your research that spatial planning would actually shift from being um, directed towards the growth ideology is that we see in all of our countries the spatial planning has been at least in the last 30 years mostly directed towards yielding as much as economic gain from the space like leaving the social needs aside, always. You know, well maybe it's different to, I don't know, northern and western countries, to the southern countries, but that's the basic principle. Um, do you see that this is gonna change with these initiatives? Not just with these initiatives, but we've seen that the last two Pritzker prices went to non-Frank Gehry types of architecture, not architecture, but more architecture that is in line with what you were showing us with reuse, with like grassroots needs, with social needs. So do you see this, so th the first one, translation to policy, and B, do you see this shift happening? So policy going really to that new ideals in what spatial planning is all about. No, I throw two words just to remind myself what I have to speak about. So the answer to the first question is festival, and the second, and the second answer is uh, Piazza Verde. Okay, now I, I, I answer the thing. So, um, so when it comes to policies to reuse public spaces, there are not really specific uh, laws or uh, like technical policies. 
in the majority of the cases, the, the solution is to organize festivals. So many of the projects, maybe not really this one that I showed, by, but in general, these kind of tact tactical projects are um, developed when there is like an architectural festival or an art festival. So the use of the space, which is temporary, is allowed because there is an event. So somehow like tactical urbanism uh, uh, uses or appropriate uh, the policies of art festival, social festival, whatever festivals to use temporary the space. Because there is not really any specific law that allows for this. So we only have like temporary use of, uh, of uh, open space. Um, and it's, so it's still an issue. Uh, and this thing of appropriating uh, festival policies, uh, so in a way hacking the system, it's, it's not just uh, about the, the, the use of the land, but of other several reasons and other several topics. So for instance, when it comes to how do I engage citizens in co-construction, like you need to have certain like uh, mm -hmm. safety uh, regulation, you have to, um, you have to be able to, to engage them in, in, a safe, in a safe way. So also in that sense, like it's always about like finding in between like gray zones uh, of the law so that you can, uh, I don't know, form a temporary association uh, so that people can join you in the construction process. Or you have to, um, um, how to say, for example, the, the project in Aprilia, uh, so this big square in the periphery of Rome, uh, from the competition uh, rules, uh, it was not allowed, uh, or it was only allowed for architects to uh, to apply for the competition. So the architects, this horizontal collective, they have to, they had to pretend that these other sociologists and art uh, art uh, collective were just like uh, helping out in giving suggestions, you know, to to be able to involve them in the process. So it's always about like finding really these gray zones. For instance, I, I, like. For from my experience talking with the practices, this thing of the festival, so to be able to, to, to uh, act during the festival, to be able to use the space is the main, is the main thing. Or to, um, to actually speak with municipality and say, okay, we are organizing this temporary comp uh, workshop thing, we will use the space just for a couple of days or a week, and then eventually the thing stays there, no one is asking, so it's, it's really just still acting in this sense and, and hoping that no one throws the stuff that they built. And eventually it happened, so they, uh, the same collective Horizontale, uh, they did this project, it's called the Iceberg. Uh, it's again a similar situation as Aprilia, so it was supposed to be a market square, no market happened, it remained empty. And they started building these little wooden structures, so also the fact of using these temporary light elements it's a way to say we're not doing anything like permanent, so don't worry, like we're gonna like you know demolish it and, and throw it somewhere. So it's also uh, how to say counting on the fact that they are not disturbing too much. And then eventually the municipality forgets that they are there and the thing stays. So it's, it's, it's more or less the, the, the current situation. And there is a hope uh, in a way, so um, I mentioned Piazza Aperte. So Piazza Aperte is a project from the municipality of Milan uh, that is based on tactical urban interventions, but it's like, it's organized. So the municipality chose several different squares in more or less peripheral areas of Milan. And uh, actually with the help of one of the architects from Horizontale Collective, they started a, like a participatory process to revive these squares that were not really squares. So one was a crossroad, it's actually next to my house, so I know, I know it pretty well. Uh, so it was a big crossroad and they, they did this kind of temporary looking intervention. They put uh, plants around, they changed the mobility and they, like, like the way cars can actually uh, move around and they painted uh, the pavement and put some benches. So supposedly this is like, these are like temporary, really temporary in the sense that it's just painting plants and seats to then in a second phase make it permanent. And this is quite, it's quite a unique examples for now, like this idea of uh, create these temporary interventions to then 
collect fundings and money to make them permanent. And there is more and more support uh, from municipalities when it comes to this. So in, in Portugal, it's more, it's more uh, diffuse. So this BBC program I told you, it's been active now uh, since several years and it's working pretty well. And uh, there are more and more projects funded and supporting in this sense. This Piazza Aperte is an experiment in Milan, and it's also and it's also working. I have the feeling that the more um, peripheral and uh, really left out the places are, the easier it is in a way for this project to stay because there is less interest. And the more these situations are central, and the harder harder it is to uh, to allow for them to stay and to and to develop. But there is there is something. Maybe, maybe Germany also, it's way like, uh, way more advanced in this sense. I mean, like we have German friends are. Please, yes. I, I, I'm sorry, there, is, there are too many questions, but I also have a question to you. It was super interesting, <laughs> and, but everything else is very interesting. I was, I mean, you basically described two types. One, it's really bottom up, and the other is, you know, basically a top-down model trying to revive participation. I was wondering that in, in your research, when let's say the, the pure bottom-up models or whatever you want to call that, who are those ones who really engage at the beginning? Who are the first ones? Are they locals? Are they locals who are, happen to be architects or architects who live in different, you know, who have social responsibilities? What do we know about them? That's quite, it's quite a crucial question because, um, so in all the project we, we analyze there are very different situations. Um, so sometimes it's the ar architecture collective initiating the project, and in the majority of these cases, the project fails because it's okay. I'm an architect. I see an urban void. It's amazing. I do something, and then I hope someone joins, and then nothing happens afterwards. Um, there are cases in which there is a community of citizens, like uh, with no cultural or specific uh, architectural background, who is willing to do something in an abandoned space. And it's usually small groups of citizens, like, I don't know, association made of 10 people who are really, really active. And, um, but in, the, in that case, it works because there is an initial will and a need to do something. And, um, and eventually, through this construction workshop, this community grows around the project. Um, and there is no real, uh, as I said, background about architecture. It's just like people who are interested in taking care of their own neighborhood. Mm. Uh, and usually it stays in, in this sense, um, but with the help often of architectural students. So many of these workshops organized by Construct Lab or Horizontale, they always engage architectural students because it's a, it's a support in terms of design and construction. Um, but then these people are leaving and then the, the, the community, the neighborhood states. Um, the, so I think like mainly it's, it's this second uh, situation that is more diffuse and that helps projects to develop through time. Um, it is harder that someone comes from outside and tries to do something and it works because otherwise the community is not really understanding what is happening. It's also not maybe welcoming a project which is coming like kind of landing uh, from outside or from the top uh, again. Um, but um, there are other situations uh, where um, let's say the community is not so strongly uh, rooted in the space or in a specific site, and then it takes a bit longer to construct this process, and then uh, it needs more time and more energies and more projects to actually build a strong sense of belonging and att attachment to the space. Um, but, but actually, thankfully, there are really a lot of citizen associations who are willing to, to take care of this kind of sites and, uh, and initiate this project, but they need some support from outside. Yeah, uh, I was wondering how important it uh, is that this is opera, the whole pro project about opera in Italy. So uh, would it also be 
a possibility to have a truck with uh, jazz concerts or uh, circus events uh, and, and would this also function in Italy? And what does it say about the cultural self-understanding of the cities that uh, um, enable people or enable the project to do that? And uh, the other, or, or you could also ask this question in a different way. You could also say is there is a specific uh, relation between opera and public space, and uh, this is the, the reason why it works so well. So, yeah, that's my question. It wasn't like I found it pretty amazing that it was opera, first of all, because it's a very rare example um, of how um, opera is uh, opening up. Because in general, even when theaters are trying to sort of modernize uh, uh, themselves, they usually try to have a jazz concert inside the hall. So it's about bringing something new inside the theater rather than bringing opera out. So I couldn't really find other benchmarking, uh, other yeah, practices that could act as a benchmark uh, in other parts of, uh, of Europe. There is Opera North in Leeds uh, that is doing similar things. It's called Whistle Stop Opera, and they uh, bring reductions of operas, for example, in pubs and, uh, and, other, uh, and other spaces, which are in public anyways. So this, uh, uh, this means a lot. And um, anyways, opera is, of course, a strong, uh, strongly rooted uh, in Italian cultural heritage, but it's not really perceived uh, as such. But uh, especially this, the way you asked uh, the second question is uh, interesting to me, because like, during my research, I also did a lot of uh, like, historical um, background research to see how theater was actually perceived and built somehow in the uh, Italian theatrical experience. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to see um, how there was a progressive enclosure of the operatic experience. Uh, so opera used to be, um, opera theaters used to be sort of squares uh, at some point because it, was, it wasn't until uh, the 19th century that uh, seats were introduced uh, in the parterre so that people could initially come and go. And uh, I remember I was talking to the director of the uh, historical archive of uh, Opera di Roma who came up with a brilliant metaphor. So he said, imagine you're in a pub and there's people talking and eating uh, and uh, acting loudly and very informally. And then there is a screen in the background that is playing a, a soccer match. And then at some point there is the, um, the speaker that raises his voice to signal an action. And when the football player scores a point, uh, people uh, turn and they applaud and they uh, burst out in exclamations. Uh, Etc. So he said, this is what an Italian opera theater looked like in the uh, 18th century. There were people that were doing their stuff, they were using the cultural occasion to socialize, uh, and then when they heard the famous aria, they turned to, finally to the stage, uh, they listened to the aria, they asked uh, to play it a second time, and, uh, and that's how it went on. So there was a strong mixture historically of uh, uh, sociability and opera theater specifically, especially because it was, it was a very strong infrastructure. It was pervasive, it was everywhere somehow. Um, so I found it a way of recovering, uh, not just a way of performing, but a way of doing opera in the widest sense of the word um, that was very meaningful. And uh, it sort of, uh, um, it wasn't a novelty, it was a way of uh, remembering how it used to be in the past. So. Um, that was very interesting. And uh, even more than uh, people perceiving it as their own heritage, uh, it was sort of a, an intrinsic reminiscence of how theater used to be, somehow, opera theater specifically. Uh, because I really loved your presentation, and actually I think that the fact that it's opera is amazing. I'm, I'm a big opera fan, but it's <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a small little. <laughs> no. One of the things I think about opera is that while it's so emotional, most people are afraid of it because it's kind of poshy. In Greece, it's like this. I think in Italy, it's exactly this because I lived some years there. Um, so I think it's brilliant, and uh, I think I'm going to attack you later to learn more. But I have a very basic question. Maybe I skipped it. How? Do you get uh, funded about this? Because it's a brilliant idea, but there are people working on it. There are artists and the camion, the gas. The how how does this work? Because I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially in the case of Palermo, which required uh, even a broader programming uh, of uh, rehearsals with the community, etc. Um, they put in place a very brilliant escamotage for that. 
because as I was telling you, uh, it doesn't get funded like as a performance, like you get money for that project, at least not for the ministry. Again, the local level is a little more responsive, and so um, they receive funding for, social, for a social activity, by the way. It was interesting that the municipality gave them funds for what they considered it to be a social activity. And uh, in the case of, uh, of Palermo, they added another layer of funding um, because since 2017, with Art Bonus in Italy, um, people can deduct, um, uh, they can get financial discount, like they can deduct from their taxes uh, by donating to the arts. And uh, theaters are doing that so badly. Like, no, I mean, like everyone is like general support to the theater and uh, like, they can't raise as much as like as much money as they would if they attached it to a particular project, which was was uh, both actually Palermo and Rome did. Like in the case of Palermo, they uh, funded with Art Bonus uh, um, the um, the Danisini project, whereas in Opera di Roma, uh, all the singers uh, that were singing in the project were very young. They belonged to the uh, theater's young artist program, which is very uh, which is an also another important element because they felt. Um, happier to perform in an informal environment and then probably an established actor would have. And then uh, in, in the Roman case, they had the Adopt a Singer campaign. So uh, people donate to, um, to adopt a singer, to follow his career, to help them build their career path. And so this is how it was, uh, it was funded, uh, together with the uh, funding from the municipal and regional levels, but not from the ministerial one. Okay, I have to say we stop now because we have to go for lunch, but anyhow, we are having our notes all together, so we will continue after the second uh, panel. So, thank you so much. And thank you.